Okay, we can start. Great, thank you. Thank you everyone for um, being here with us, um, attending our new uh, series of Global Minds for Ukraine lectures. Today we have a special occasion, a special guest. But before we start this lecture, let me just say a few words about what is happening right now um, in Ukraine. We just have received this news that the Zaporizhia nuclear plant uh, has been occupied for, for a while. Uh, nevertheless, there will there were some new advances. Um, I believe that this is perhaps the first case of nuclear terrorism in, in history, at least recent history, uh, which is of course unacceptable. Uh, and um, I believe that this 30 kilometer zone around the nuclear power plant should be recognized as territories where it is forbidden to place military equipment, manpower, and the flight of missiles is should be excluded from the 30 kilometer zones. Unfortunately, this is not the case as of now, which has caused some uh, new uh, terrible risks. Today at about 12 noon, as a result of hostilities in the area of the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear uh, power plant, uh, the overhead line was disconnected, so which caused units number five and unit number six eventually uh, to be disconnected from the network with a subsequent tripping of the emergency protection. Um, we did not plan it, it just um, Serendipi uh, serendipity, it's a coincidence that uh, today we have a lecture which is very relevant uh, to put uh, this um, event in the broader context. Uh, we have a guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Tokjan Kasenova. She is a Washington DC based senior fellow with a project on international security, commerce and economic uh, statecraft. From 2011 to 2015, she served on the UN Secretary General's Advisory Board on Disarm Matters, and she's the author of Atomic Step, How Kazakhstan Gave Up the Bombs. So she's a real expert on the issues of nuclear security and international affairs. She, and today she will give you uh, some uh, insights uh, you know, about what constitutes nuclear and radiological security, the differences between nuclear and radiological material and respective vulnerabilities, and international legal framework on nuclear and radiological security. So um, thank you very much for being with us, even in these uh, dark moments. We are happy to be, you know, with you and to um, be enlightened with your lecture. So thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Timofey. Um, I just want to start my remarks today by expressing my full solidarity with Ukraine and the people of Ukraine. Um, and I just also want to say how impressed I have been with the academic community. And um, I think it's an, it's an incredible manifestation of resilience, which we observe in so many ways from Ukraine. But the fact that the it, the education process is going on uh, is really uh, remarkable. And I'm just grateful for the chance to, to be part of this process and make my small contribution. Um, as Sima Fey mentioned, uh, when we initially planned to have a, um, a lecture on nuclear security, uh, it was more based you know, on my teaching background and expertise and um, I really couldn't imagine how um, relevant, but in a very concerning way, uh, all these topics have become. And um, I think what's especially concerning is that the situation on the ground is very challenge, uh, challenging, but also fluid, and that um, the news come every few hours. And um, but let let me. Uh, uh, start sharing my slides. So I thought that today uh, I'll um, I'll 
start with describing uh, the difference between nuclear and radiological material and explain some of the vulnerabilities to, to give uh, the audience some foundational uh, knowledge. And we'll also specifically talk about nuclear power plants and what, were, what have been historic safety and security con considerations when it came to nuclear power plants. I'll also briefly, and I'll try not to bore you, <laughs> But I think it's important that we spend a little bit of time on international legal instruments and see what's what might be relevant to today's situation. And finally, um, I will talk about the one of uh, several nuclear angles of Russia's war against Ukraine, and we'll talk specifically about the situation with the nuclear power plants. I'll preface by saying, please don't be alarmed by the technical sound in topic of my presentation. I'm not a scientist, not an engineer. I'm um, uh, a, a political, a policy person. So I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that um, it's not too technical. And, um, and I hope that um, it will be easy to access, but also I'm really looking forward to your questions. Please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions in the chat or uh, during afterwards during the Q&A session. So let's look at nuclear material first. Why do we worry about it? So the main reason we worry about nuclear material is because it's nuclear material that you need to create a nuclear weapon. Right. So if you have a state or maybe a non-state actor, a terrorist group, for example, and if you combine that with the desire and capacity and access to nuclear material and technology, then you can get a nuclear bomb. So one of the main um, challenges or objectives in the nuclear policy field in the no of the non-proliferation regime is how to make sure that this connection doesn't happen, that there is no access to nuclear material and technology for uh, illegal weapons purposes. And if we look at the process of creating a nuclear weapon, um, and um, sorry for my very simplistic graphic, but I, I was just trying to convey that if, for example, the process of, of a nuclear weapon, we look at it as a, as a linear process, then the the component of producing nuclear material is one of the most, one of the hardest, most challenging technologically uh, parts of the process. So once you get material, whether you were able to produce it, or you stole it, or illegally obtained from somewhere, you are very advanced towards your goal of um, having a, a nuclear uh, device or a nuclear weapon. There are two main um, categories of nuclear material that are usable in a nuclear weapon. And these are highly enriched uranium and plutonium, okay? So let's look at highly enriched uranium first. And um, so you cannot use natural uranium straight in a device or um, in a nuclear power plant. You have to um, you have to enrich it to a certain level. And what does it mean to enrich it? So basically, if you look at this graph, you'll see all the blue dots. And uh, blue dots is our uranium two three eight, and that's how you know if we if we look at natural uranium, then you, most uh, of the radioisotopes would be uh, two three five, and then only a tiny fraction will be uranium two three. Um, the, the main component will be 238, and then the little fraction will be 235. And mostly for uh, to produce nuclear fuel that is enriched enough uh, to power nuclear power plants, um, a, a low level of enrichment is enough. You know, if you increase the composition uh, of U235 to 5%, uh, that will be considered your 5% enrichment, and that's very good um, for nuclear fuel that you can use in a nuclear power plant. But the same technology, and this is where the sensitivities come, the same technology of enrichment, if you push it more, if you enrich it to a higher level, that, that's when uranium becomes 
uh, highly enriched and weapons usable. That's when you can start using it as a fuel um, in a nuclear weapon, okay? When it comes to plutonium, it's a little bit different. So uh, plutonium uh, uh, doesn't occur naturally as natural uranium. It's mostly a byproduct of reactor operations. So um, if a nuclear power plant operates and uses nuclear fuel, then what you get uh, in the end is spent fuel, right? It's the fuel that was already used. And um, it is possible to extract plutonium from this spent fuel with the help of the process called reprocessing. So without going into you know, any technical details because we don't need them, I just want to point out that from the non-proliferation view, these two types of processes, enrichment of uranium and reprocessing of spent fuel are considered to be sensitive and they're considered to be sensitive exactly for this reason that from these processes, you can get access to material that can be used in a nuclear weapon. Okay. So to recap, for nuclear weapons, highly enriched uranium and plutonium. It's very important to know that nuclear material and radiological material are not the same. So uh, let's look at radiological material now. The, the interesting thing, I guess, of about radiological material is that while you know general public is of course very concerned with anything that has the word radioactivity and so on, um, we actually need it in our everyday life for very good, peaceful purposes. And on the slide, you see just a couple of examples of when radiological material is uh, very useful. Uh, one is in uh, agriculture, because um, when you irradiate, for example, fruits or vegetables, you make them um, last longer. Um, it, you, it's also used in agriculture for dealing with insects and so on. But even more importantly, radiological material is very important in the medical field, uh, both for diagnosing different diseases, because when, you, they, when they make you um, ingest small quantities of radioactive material, it kind of lights up and, and, and the doctors can, can see, they can diagnose what's happening inside, or, you know, of course, as we know, for uh, cancer treatment, um, radiological material is also extremely useful and, and necessary. And noting that we need radiological material in everyday life, it makes it very different from nuclear material because uh, it's much more common in everyday use. And it's also used in places which you cannot control or protect with the same zeal, I guess, as um, nuclear material, right? Because you cannot put armed guards outside of a hospital or outside of a university that hosts a nuclear research reactor or, you know, obviously in agricultural field as well. So that, that, that creates a situation where radiological material is all around us, um, used for very benign peaceful purposes. And that makes it more vulnerable, right? Because you have more, it's more accessible. But here it's very important when we talk about security implications, it's very important to have a correct risk assessment because it's not that all radioactive sources are the same uh, and only specific radioisotopes are considered to be high risk and you can see them on this slide. And they're considered high risk because they are the most usable in, an, in a radiological device, right? Um, and here, again, I just want to, to give some terminology. So, 
when we say the word nuclear device or nuclear weapon, we we mean a weapon with nuclear material. When we say a radiological device, or sometimes com, you know, in common parlance, sometimes people say dirty bomb. Uh, that means a device that uh, uses radiological material. And so on one hand, you have it all around us. On the other hand, only certain radioisotopes are high risk. Um, in terms of potential damage, you cannot compare a nuclear device with a radiological device because if a nuclear weapon is detonated, detonated we're talking about thousands of people and we're talking about kilometers of land that is destroyed contaminated and so on with a radiological device the impact the immediate impact is smaller but it doesn't mean that it's negligible or can be ignored because uh, and i'll show you how even one radiological source can cause a lot of contamination panic severe economic consequences and so on. But just in terms of scale, right? You cannot compare a nuclear device with a, with a radiological device. Um, what are orphan sources? Orphan sources are radioactive sources that don't have an owner anymore. And how does it happen? For example, it can be that the hospital used the um certain device with a radiological source inside and then they either stopped using it abandon it and didn't dispose properly or maybe they moved to another place and also left the device behind uh, so it might be lost or it might be stolen basically these orphan radiological sources are the ones that are not accounted for It's really quite difficult to have um, good systems in place worldwide to detect radiological sources. And the number one limitation um, in this regard comes from capacity. Because in order to detect, you have to have radiological portals, right? Uh, you also have to have trained customs and border officials and you know part of my job is to travel to third countries and uh, engage in capacity building on 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 these issues and and honestly if you go to a country where the primary concerns are uh, smuggling of small arms for example right or they're facing really difficult public health challenges. It's really difficult to expect these countries to invest into uh, radiological equipment uh, at, at borders and so on. So there is a lot of technical assistance coming to such countries, but uh, I would say it's still um, um, a challenge if we're talking about uh, countries in general. And what can you do with with a with a radiological device you can explode it you can drop it from a plane or you can put it for example in the middle of a um, busy highway right and then it will become um also a, a source of, a, of exposure I wanted to bring it more to now to make it less abstract and to show you a real life example of how even one uh, mishandled radiological source can cause uh, a lot of trouble. Uh, and this case comes from Brazil from from the 80s. Um, it happened in uh, uh, in a state in a city called uh, in a state called Goiania. Um, what happened there was that the medical institution, a scenario that I, I mentioned as a, you know, as an abstract, as, a, as, you know, something in theory, it actually happened in real life. Um, there was a private um, radiotherapy institution and uh, they were changing premises. 
And um, they took with them one device that contained cobalt. And we, we saw cobalt is on our list of high risk radiological sources. But for some reason, they left behind one more device that contained cesium-137. And, and cesium is very, very dangerous. And, and so they, they left that unit. And then some local people just found it and they got interested. They thought, oh, maybe we can use it for scrap metal. Um, so what they ended up doing, they, um, they, un, how to say, they basically they they dis, they uh, disrupted the um, the capsule, and so cesium became, um, um, you know, kind of got out. Um, and, but they also, what they noticed is that the material was glowing in the dark. So it became a local attraction. People started, uh, you know, looking at this material, even rubbing on their skin and, and so on. And then of course, everybody started getting uh, sick from, from exposure. Um, for a few days, you know, in a few days, they started showing symptoms. Um, and, and initially, the local doctors didn't even realize that it was because of exposure to radiation. Uh, and, but once they understood that it was exposure, a, a large scale operation had to be um, to be launched with the help of the, uh, of the IEA. And to give you a sense of the of the scale, they had to use a stadium to put people there in order to check uh, local population on who was exposed and who was not. And they had to monitor more than 112,000 people. And uh, they realized that around 249 people were exposed either internally ingestion or externally on their skin. Uh, 85 houses were contaminated and um, the, the amount of uh, waste, you know, because they had to raise some buildings entirely, that amount of waste could fill 275 truckloads. So you can just imagine, and that's from one radiological source. So let's kind of look at the state of play if we are to compare nuclear and radiological material. Um, so with nuclear material, it's obviously very high risk, right? And, but it's, um, it can be found in very few countries. So right now uh, it's about 22 countries that have significant nuclear material. Um, and you can see the, the total numbers on the slide on the left side. And uh, most of this material is, uh, is in countries that have nuclear weapons programs. You can also see the photos of the, just to give you a scale that you don't need that much of nuclear material to build a simple nuclear device. In terms, because it's very um, uh, dense, I guess. So, for example, the amount of HU needed to build a simple nuclear weapon would be equivalent to a, a you know, a regular bag of sugar uh, with plutonium. It will be the size of a grapefruit. And worldwide, uh, we have tons and tons of highly enriched uranium and plutonium, and in addition to 14,000 nuclear weapons that already exist in the world, with the material that is available worldwide, you can, you can build another 20,000 20, uh, nuclear bombs. But look at the, uh, at the percentage of nuclear material, you can see that 83% of it is in military stocks and 17% is in civilian stocks. And uh, and here, you know, on one hand, um, it 
to some it might seem you know good that uh if most of it is in military stocks it means that it's uh well protected well guarded right uh because we know that civilian stocks are less protected but the problem with the military stocks is that nobody from the outside can say anything about how the certain country is managing its nuclear materials so there are no international instruments that would be dealing for example with the security of nuclear material that is in military stocks for radiological material as we discussed you can find it almost in every country in the world but only a few are considered to be high risk uh, i wanted to show you a little bit you know what's the you know like what's the risk in terms of numbers and the international atomic energy agency it runs a, a database and the they stopped publishing the the actual numbers um the the latest that uh can be found in open source are from 2019 but you can see the numbers on the screen right and I think on, on the first glance, it's really scary that we have more than 3,000 cases. Uh, but if you look a little bit more attentively, you see that uh, most of them actually involve radiological material and most of them are not malicious, right? It's not that somebody specifically wanted to do something wrong. It's mostly that the country cannot account for them um, and, and so on. But having said that, you know, there were cases that involved uh, highly enriched uranium. And of course, it's still really concerning that um, trafficking is happening. Um, another important thing to know about this database is that it's completely voluntary. So it's what the governments reported to the IAEA, right? So we cannot be sure that that's, the, that's full information. I wanted to give you some cases of when um, security was breached, and these cases involve nuclear material. The first case comes from South Africa, and uh, maybe some of you know, but South Africa had a nuclear weapons program. It had six nuclear bombs. Uh, it gave up on its uh, weapons program, but it still has sufficient amounts of highly enriched uranium. And so in 2007, there was this huge case when armed people uh, entered the nuclear facility in South Africa, the facility that had HEU on site. Um, uh, they wounded some people and, and so on, and uh, they didn't, they were not able to steal it, but it just showed how vulnerable nuclear material is. Another case is from the United States, actually. And uh, the US is mm, normally considered to be very good with nuclear security, but I wanted to use this case just to show that uh, even in countries that have strict regulations and invest a lot into capacity to uh, secure nuclear and radiological material, things can happen. And so this case is it's, 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 <laughs> it's, it's pretty something. It was in 2012, and those were anti-nuclear activists, um, including a, a, an elderly nun. I think she was in her 80s when it happened. And basically, they were able to enter the premises of the really, really high security compound uh, at Oak Ridge, uh, at an Oak Ridge facility. And uh, this happened because of a combination of uh, things that went wrong, including the fact that security, perimeter security was outsourced to third companies and they were, I think, working on alarms or something. So there was, yeah, for some reason, the, the, the security didn't kick in, but also when um, guards saw the nun, they assumed that, you know, like that they looked benign enough and they didn't shoot, right? Uh, but again, even though in this case, these people were not after nuclear material, they were more just anti-nuclear activists, it showed the vulnerabilities even in highly secure sites 
And, you know, with all of that, with nuclear material and radiological material, the worry is that, and historically, it was really mostly about non-state actors that somebody, uh, a determined group can get access to nuclear or radiological material and then create an incident, right? And uh, in the past, for example, ISIS and Al-Qaeda expressed desire to acquire weapons of mass destruction. Um, in 2016, for those of you who remember, there were terrorist attacks um, in, in Paris when they simultaneously attacked several uh, sites. And then later on, it became known that one of the suspects in Paris attacks, um, he had footage of surveillance of a Belgian nuclear official. And why it's worrying, it means that for some reason they were monitoring this person. And why it's dangerous, it's because maybe it could have been used then for uh, blackmail, right? To make this person give some information or give some material or something. And it just showed that uh, in terms of motivation, we definitely know that uh, some groups might be after, uh, after weapons of mass destruction. So let's now go to the next section and speak, uh, talk specifically about nuclear power plants. And um, you know how, I don't know in Ukrainian whether the word uh, safety and security is the same, because in Russian it's the same word, безопасность, right? And in English, these are two different words. So in English, I just wanted to to, to point out that safety refers to accidents. It's something that is not deliberate, right? It's something that happened because of nature or human error. And security, it's more about deliberate attacks um, when somebody, somebody deliberately wants to do something. But the, the end result or the worry about both is radioactive contamination, right? Whether it's because uh, something natural occurred, some natural disaster, or because somebody attacked a nuclear facility, why we worry about both is because of the uh, contamination. Right? And that there are many vulnerabilities that nuclear power plants uh, face. I just, I, I, want, I wanted to put the, the, the main ones and, uh, and you'll see how what I'm saying now in terms of just general education is relevant to uh, Ukraine when we come to the cases of Chernobyl and Zaporozhye. So the main categories of vulnerabilities for nuclear power plants historically are considered natural disaster or accident, physical attack. And you know here we mostly think about non-state actors, sabotage, insider threat, uh, or a cyber attack. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, for safety and security, often the same measures can help each other. Uh, for example, um, the fact that you have redundancy, <clears throat> redundant safety features, right? That contamination cannot occur because of just one wrong step, that there should be several before the risk contamination. <clears throat> it's also helpful for security, right? Because if somebody, wants to do something wrong, they will have to do several steps. Um, but there are also sometimes uh, measures that are a little bit at tension with each other. For example, look at information sharing, right? For safety reasons, you would, <clears throat> you would want to share information with many relevant parties to make sure that mistakes are avoided. But for security reasons, you would want to protect your information, right? You want to have as few people as possible having certain information. Main actors also are different. You know, when we're talking about safety, it's more about engineers and health experts. And for security, you need law enforcement. You need people with guns, for example, if it's a if it's an armed protected uh, facility, usually nuclear power plants uh, are not. Um, and for safety reasons, you would want to remove people as fast as possible uh, 
from the premises. But for security reasons, if there is some something is happening uh, and you don't know what is happening, you would want a lockdown, right? In order to understand who is responsible, who is on premises and, and so on. So, you know, again, it's in very basic terms, but um, let's look at general components of a nuclear power plant and see what kind of uh, vulnerabilities um, we, we're talking about. The most important part of any nuclear power plant is, of course, the, the reactor itself, right? And so your reactor is the most, uh, it's the place where um, there is the highest radioactive level, but it's also the component of a nuclear power plant that is best protected, right? You have containment structures, um, especially after 9-11, um, many countries, including Ukraine, went through re-evaluation and um, after Chernobyl as well. Uh, but now... Um, Reactor core buildings are considered to be very well protected from the outside attack, right? That even if an airplane crashes, uh, it should be okay. Another important component of any nuclear power uh, plant is the cooling system, because you need uh, to cool down the reactor, right? And, and, and here, what's important for us especially in light of the news that are coming out, is access to electricity, right? That in order for the cooling system to work, you need unrestricted access to electricity. And again, nuclear facilities are of course prepared, you know, they have several layers of access to electricity. You have your primary access and then you have, um, backup systems, usually diesel generators. Another component of a nuclear power plant is where you, you store spent fuel, right? So you, uh, you operated your nuclear power plant, you use fuel, and then this spent fuel you need to put somewhere while it um, cools down. And so this this is another vulnerability because there is some radiation, but unlike the reactor core, the levels are, um, are lower. And um, so on one hand, they're less protected. On the other, they're not as high risk as for example, uh, anything to do uh, with reactor uh, core. We had three nuclear, um, accidents in the past uh, in the U.S. Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, of course, and Fukushima. And I wanted to give you a, a rundown of some of the lessons from uh, Fukushima because, again, you'll see the parallels that are very useful for today. So what Fukushima taught us is that even if you're prepared for a natural disaster, because uh, Fukushima, Japan was prepared for earthquakes. What they were not prepared is that there would be an earthquake and then a tsunami, right? Um, we also learned that it's just so critical that there is constant uninterrupted access to power source because what happened with Fukushima is that it's the access to power that was damaged because of um, earthquakes and tsunami, and that caused the cooling systems to stop operating, and you know, and then it it led to reactor core meltdown. We also learned that it's very important that personnel is trained and prepared to deal with multiple emergencies happening at once, and that. You know, in Japan, because it wasn't just a separate nuclear incident, right? It was part of a major event, broad event. You had an earthquake, you had tsunami. So emergency personnel was already uh, stretched very thin. And, and so 
that's another lesson that was learned from Fukushima that you need to be prepared for when for when it's not an isolated nuclear event, but when a, a more major broad crisis is happening. And that's, of course, the case of Ukraine, that we're not talking about some isolated potential risk. We're talking about a, a broader um, serious security situation. Fukushima also showed us that um, any delays in terms of information, what's happening on the ground, and this information not being shared on time with regulators or regulators not sharing their information directly with people on the ground, that it really can be very uh, detrimental, that you always need to have this clear, clear lines of communication between regulators, operators, and everybody, everybody involved. Again, very directly relevant to Ukraine right now. And of course, the preparedness of local population, right? That you need people to, to know what they're supposed to do, uh, basic safety precautions and so on. And, and just before I move to a Ukraine specific part, just in general, the discourse, historically discourse on nuclear terrorism, it mostly revolved around, you know, whether somebody can steal a nuclear weapon, very unlikely, it's very difficult, I, I would say almost impossible, construction of a nuclear weapon, it is possible if you get uh, access to nuclear material, damage to a nuclear reactor facility. But historically, it was always about non-state actors, that it's some terrorist group would try, and then you would have state force, state level response to deal with it. And then, of course, uh, construction of a dirty bomb using a radiological dispersal device. There are some international instruments that are relevant to nuclear safety and security, to nuclear safety, or just nuclear security. Um, I would just mention that the only legally binding treaty uh, that is relevant to nuclear security of nuclear material, uh, civil nuclear material, is the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material. For anybody interested, uh, you can then, you know, later you can research a little bit more. Um, there is also this International Convention on the Suppression of Acts of Nuclear Terrorism, but again, it's always the the discourse has always been about mostly non-state actors. Um, what about attacks on nuclear power plants? What do we have in terms of international law? Um, with a disclaimer that I'm not an, a lawyer, um, the two relevant uh, instruments are Geneva Conventions, uh, because they prohibit uh, attacks on nuclear power plants. Uh, there is some language that creates some limitations, and I saw some discourse, Ukraine-focused discourse in Western media that ba basically claimed that, oh no, Geneva Conventions are not banning attacks on nuclear power plants. Um, I kind of disagree with that interpretation. I, I do think that Geneva Conventions are extremely relevant. Um, for those of you who are interested in specific language, check out Protocol 1 and 2 to Geneva Conventions. Um, what's interesting, it's, it appears as though Russia initially uh, ratified Protocol 1, but in 2019, uh, it seems that it withdrew, but it's still considered to be an international no norm because it's ratified by 170 people. Uh, and Russia did ratify protocol too. There is also humanitarian law. And here, you know, especially for those of you who are lawyers, uh, there is rule 42, and there is some language about particular care to be taken when activities are happening near uh, nuclear power plants. It's interesting that rule 42 is specifically integrated into Russian military guidelines. So, you know, on here, there is no ambiguity because it is integrated. And again, you know, for those of you who are interested, I, uh, I would just advise to, to check the language. So um, we have the International Atomic Energy Agency and it has three functions, right? It has 
a function of giving access to countries to peaceful nuclear technology. It has um, responsibilities for setting uh, standards for safety and security. And also the third function is safeguards. And basically safeguards, it's more that the country doesn't misuse nuclear material that it has, doesn't convert it from peaceful uses to military use. And here, you know, we're coming to our Ukrainian component. component. Uh, have a look at what the uh, what Rafael Grossi, the head of the IA, said in March 2nd, right? He reminded about seven pillars of nuclear safety, and it's about physical integrity. It's that all equipment should be functional. It's about that the staff shouldn't be under pressure Right? that there should be uninterrupted supply of uh, components and so on. And look at the language from the IA update from August 6th. Here we already have a strong statement basically saying all pillars have been undermined uh, in one way or another. Uh, he also just recently um, uh, spoke in New York and there, again, the language was very forceful um, that uh, these pillars have been undermined. Um, so for Chernobyl, um, you know, of course, everybody was so worried about Chernobyl. Um, and It, but just for, for now, you know, because um, because Russian military withdrew from, from there, this is, you know, it's now taken a back seat. But back at the time, you know, obviously everybody on, on the outside was very worried. What was happening in the kind of on the outside, the nuclear policy community, my colleagues, the way they were following that, I think they were trying to provide a more nuanced information on that or noting that it's just so hard to understand what's truly happening on the ground but uh, mostly uh, my colleagues especially those with more technical training they would just explain uh, that you know these these parts of news are less concerning than the others and 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 here you know mostly what was happening that um a lot of dust that was still contaminated uh, was disturbed, right? And so you had uh, some elevation of uh, uh, radioactivity levels uh, because of all this dust, uh, but it wasn't uh, something that was too, you know, of immediate health concern. Zaporozhye is another, like it's it's on another level, and I I'm I'm personally extremely worried, uh, especially because it's such a fluid situation, and um, really, <laughs> just as somebody who, you know, taught nuclear security I, uh, at the university, so and just like all the discussions that. They had a completely different band, right? As I've mentioned, it was mostly about, um, you know, some terrorist groups. And we were always told that it's only specific, well-equipped terrorist groups that can try something like that. You have to be really well organized for that. And all the guidelines and all the policy recommendations, they are all mostly were designed, you know, with a scenario that it's a state response against a non-state actor. And of course, you know, no non-state actor, no matter how organized you are, can equal a state, right? And, and so it's really, I think what's difficult is that nobody was prepared or is prepared for a situation that you actually have a state level actor uh, overtaking a nuclear facility. So it does seem as though the IA will be able to get in uh, in a matter of days. That's something that everybody is watching. But let's talk about um, some of the main practical concerns when it comes to Zaporozhye. First, you know, as I've mentioned before, you know, it's the reactors that we worry about 
the most because of uh, that's the area that is potentially highest risk in terms of radioactivity, but they're the ones that are protected, you know, really um, the best. So they all have containment shells and uh, even though, of course, it's horrible that there, there is shelling, but in terms of reactors, uh, it seems that, you know, they will be able to withstand quite a lot. Um, but of course, no nuclear power reactor was designed to operate in a war zone. And um, if there are no limits to what uh, the occupying force can do, then all, all bets are off. But for now, I think in terms of reactor cores themselves, we, we just know that uh, the, there is more containment there. It's the cooling systems that I think are the most vulnerable spot, right? Because as I've explained, there is a reliance on power source in case of Zaporozhye. Uh, as Timofey mentioned, now the regular access to the grid was cut off. It was already working on one out of four because three were damaged. Uh, so now it's it's working off the local thermo, uh, thermo plant. Um, uh, there are backup diesel generators, but for anything that is was designed to be a backup, this is not supposed to be a long-term solution, right? And if it ever switches to this backup option of diesel generators, there is nothing after that. And as the head of Energoatom, you know, explained today, basically 90 minutes without temperature control and you have a huge problem on your hands. Um, it's really concerning that Russia, uh, that, you know, it's, it is reported um, and, and it seems to be correct information that uh, Russia suggested that the plan should be switched off from Ukrainian greed and taken to Russian greed. And to in order to do that, you will definitely need to go to the, um, to the situation of backup diesel generators. And as I've explained, it's just so dangerous. I, I think that's a very dangerous uh, scenario. Spent fuel pool, as I've mentioned, you know, Normally, uh, experts are less worried about spent fuel, spent fuel storage than they are about reactor cores, but it doesn't mean that the, there is no danger, right? And we know that there, that there are a, there is equipment inside that is not supposed to be there. What if there is fire and, and so on? So that's a real uh, practical concern. The fact that plant employees are under duress, I think it's a direct risk for safety. Because, you know, it's so important that when you are dealing with a complex facility that is very structured, it's very rigid, right? All the procedures need to be to happen at certain pace, everything should be according to standard operating procedures. And uh, and the personnel, they need to be calm, right? You like, I, I cannot imagine what it feels like to work if you have people with guns uh, in the facility. We talked about, you know, when I talked in general about nuclear security, um, questions of access, right? Usually, you know, all these guidelines, all these rules are so strict about who can get access to a nuclear facility, who can get out, you know, how everything works. Like, who controls access to facility now? Who are these people who are coming and going? Uh, is it military? Uh, will, you know, are there some other groups that will be able to enter? So this is, I think, is very concerning. Um, the fact that the military seems of an occupying army seems to be in charge, I think is also very concerning because uh, for any technical facility, it's the technical people who need to be in charge and uh, who need who need to have a final say about what can be done, what cannot be done, what is safe and what's not safe. 
if there is an emergency. So we already know that there is quite a bit of equipment, right? Uh, that is not supposed to be inside the facility, but also around if there is an emergency, we talked in theory, right? We talked about lessons from Fukushima, how important it is that emergency personnel knows what they're doing, that they're readily accessible. If anything happens at Zaporozhye, how can emergency personnel get access? How quickly, how soon, and, and so on. And as I've mentioned, I, I, I you know, I, I'm I'm trying to give this lecture as 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 a nuclear policy expert, not as a uh, not as a per, not as a human, not as somebody who is whose native country is Kazakhstan and who can feel to the bone uh, the you know the the value and preciousness of sovereignty and uh, independence. But I'm speaking here simply from the nuclear security point of view attempting to switch it from one grid to another via this period of backup diesel generators is really very beyond irresponsible. Also something that is not maybe as widely discussed but remains I think a potential risk is, uh, is, is, cy is cyber warfare um, and uh, what if there is a cyber attack or, or nuclear power plants, not necessarily even on Zaporozhye, but others? Uh, you know, I don't have time to go into details, but that's something that is really um, a, a big, important part of the discourse currently, just in general for nuclear power plants, because so many of them are now less analog and are dependent on, uh, you know, digitalization and everything and, and and basically very vulnerable so with with all of that and again just you know as somebody who lives in dc i want to give you a sense of how people on the outside talk about all of this those who work on nuclear security and basically they go through all the different scenario, scenarios and risks and vulnerability and then they kind of, um, maybe it's a, a protection mechanism. They're basically saying, but it's not in Russia's interest. That would be completely against the interest. There is no point, and it's just too dangerous for, for Russia itself. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think that it's a strong enough argument um, based on the last six months. I, I don't think it's something that, you know, everybody can rely on that uh, Russia wouldn't do something that is against its own interest. And, and so these are the practical specific uh, uh, concerns, but there are also, there is this very important political angle to everything that we're discussing. It's the first time one country controls a, a nuclear facility of another country. And as I mentioned, I think the, the international community is completely unprepared for this kind of scenario. Um, there is fog of war, there is lack of access by the IAA. And I think it's really uh, difficult because nobody knows for sure what is happening. Um, I also think there is just such an important relevance of this situation to the question of Ukraine's sovereignty. And it starts from, you know, it might be more of a procedural question, right? But I do think it's important, you know, when the IA inspectors come, um, do they come through Russia controlled territory or not? Um, you know, I only briefly mentioned safeguards, um, and it's a very political area of, of, of the nuclear field, and it's Ukraine that signed the safeguards agreement with the IEA. It's Ukraine that is in charge of making sure that its nuclear material is not uh, misused, and it's Ukraine's promise and obligation to the IEA. And now we see that uh, because of the invasion, uh, Ukraine is not in control uh, of its own uh, facilities. Then, of course, the control over power supply, right? That uh, who controls energy controls 
the country and and especially noting that ukraine is so dependent on nuclear power um from what i understand almost half of electricity comes from nuclear source which makes it also a practical has practical implications because it's not that ukraine can easily just shut everything off and it not not to say that it's easy to shut it off but just also in in general in terms of energy security and so on and and finally i just wanted to leave you with the, you know what's also happening right now uh, in the world of nuclear politics so in, in new york as we speak the nuclear non-proliferation treaty review conference is drawing to a close and just a couple of hours ago the draft final document was released and uh it has several references to ukraine i don't know what will remain in the final document because it's the draft document but it's interesting and i just wanted to like to to give you a, a feel of uh what at least appears in the draft document so there is um emphasis on safeguards saying that you know ukraine uh, uh that the ukrainian authorities uh should have access to their own um, facilities for safeguards reasons, um, because it's very important to ensure non-diversion of nuclear material. Uh, there is mention of the, um, of the Budapest Memorandum. Uh, they don't, um, yeah, they don't say Budapest Memorandum. They use the formal name, they say, uh, there should be full adherence to of all nuclear weapon states to all existing obligations uh, that they've given uh, under the memorandum on security assurances in connection with Ukraine's accession to the NPT. Um, there is also an important part which I hope remains in the final document. It says, the conference stresses the paramount importance of ensuring control by Ukraine's competent authorities of nuclear facilities and other locations subject to the IA safeguards. As I mentioned, you know, we'll see what remains. Um, it's highly political, the you know, what's happening there, uh, but we'll see. There is no direct mention of uh, Russia in that context. Uh, so you can see all Ukraine relevant parts, uh, you know, they're focused on Ukraine. So, okay, I'll stop here because I already talked too, too long um, and I'm happy to to take questions. <laughs> sure, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent um, overview and your lecture. Um, you know, it was also interesting to me that, you know, in the very beginning of our meeting, I was a bit emotional. I said something about Russian being a terrorist, a nuclear terrorist state. And I didn't know about this uh, history of, of these narratives about nuclear terrorism that apparently, as you mentioned, used to be primarily about uh, non-state actors. And now uh, we have this um, new historical development. So it was very interesting to me to hear more about uh, that context so thank you so much and uh, i will read out loud some questions because uh, <laughs> there are some uh, are already gathering in the q and chat i will uh, read them so everyone knows what we are talking about so um elijah dyke she has a question um uh concerning the nature of international relations do you find joint intrastate programs like the Iran nuclear deal efficient? Are they capable of deterring states from enriching uranium through passing cycles of foreign policy and ever-changing power balance? So if I understood correctly, it's about whether Iran can be deterred from a weapons option, but have a peaceful program. Yeah. Well, I would, I think, a part of the question is, in general, uh, oh, uh, what's your yeah, Iran, about uh -huh. intrastate programs? Um, mm -hmm. Iran nuclear deal is just an example, but what's mm -hmm. your opinion on this kind of architecture? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, so on uh, on the Iran deal, I I find that Iran deal is extremely beneficial for both Iran and the international community because Iran, uh, you know. Before the U.S. withdrew under President Trump, 
Iran had uh, confirmed access to um, to nuclear technology for peaceful purposes. It also had a UN nuclear sanctions lifted, which was very important to it. But the international community, what it received in return was greater access uh, to Iran's nuclear program. So basically, if anything would be going the military direction, the international community would be able to know much faster. Um, also, you know, the technical uh, components of the deal, they were very good and specific. It was in terms of how much material can Iran produce, under what conditions, what facilities, and so on, how the International Atomic Energy Agency can get access. So it was, I think, you know, from the IR point of view, uh, it was a good deal for both Iran and for those who worry that Iran might um, misuse its uh, nuclear program. It's extremely unfortunate for the uh, for the field of not only nuclear politics, but I think in general, the norms of international agreements that because of President Trump, the US uh, left the agreement. And um, because I think it undermined the legitimacy right, of commitments under international agreements. We are really watching very attentively what's happening now. And I personally, you know, very much hope that the, um, the treat that the U.S. will return, that uh, the agreement can be reached again. Um, so, yes, I'm a big believer that uh, this kind of arrangements, especially those that are very like specific, there were 150 pages in that deal. Um, they can work, barring that something bad happens in, the, in domestic politics. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you for um, your explanation. So the next question is by Maxim uh, Chibatarov, and the question is about International Atomic uh, Energy Agency. Mm -hmm. So he uh, asks. Um, uh so he says a lot of people are asking now whether this organization could have played a more proactive role in mm -hmm. preventing or addressing what is happening in ukraine uh what happened in chernobyl and now what is happening mm -hmm. in the region it's clear that as he says it's clear this is a very unusual situation for them which goes beyond their mandate in many mm -hmm. respects but still, they could have been more proactive. What kind of lessons mm -hmm. learned or improvements mm -hmm. can you think of for the global mm -hmm. nuclear security system going forward? So uh, let me answer this question. I'll separate answering as a scholar and policy expert and answering as a, as a human, right? So as a scholar, I would say that um, the IEA is not a political organization, right? They really don't have a mandate to tell another country, get out of uh, your illegal invasion of another country. They're a very technical organization with very specific technical mandates, um, you know, along these uh, three uh, components that I've mentioned. I think they they have, especially with the, with Rafael Grossi in charge of the organization, I find that he really is at the at the extreme top of what is possible for him to say and convey as the head of a technical organization. I think he's really one of the best people to be in this position right now uh, because of his diplomatic experience and because of his, he, he's extremely good on everything to do with nuclear policy. He knows all these issues. And, and so just noting the, the mandate, but also noting the politics, right? That um, there is a board of governors, Russia is on the board. And so, you know, there are, it's it's the same as when we observe the UN, right? I would want UN maybe to be different, but I, I also recognize the limitations that are very political. So I think, um, I honestly think in this situation, the I and specifically with the leadership of Grossi, they have been doing what they could. Um, 
whether it's not, you know, it's obviously not enough simply because, yeah, the, the international community is not prepared uh, and there is no blueprint. Um, but now I want to answer as, as not a scholar or as an expert, but as somebody who is watching the IA having to conduct negotiations with Russian officials about access to Ukrainian facilities. And again, for somebody who cares so much about territorial integrity and sovereignty, it it's really hard uh, to observe, but that's on a personal kind of emotional level. On a policy practical level, what can be done and what is best for technical issues of safety and security, I think the IA is, is doing what it can. And there is a, almost a follow-up question to that mm -hmm. by someone anonymous. Um, so the question is, are the events of war and nuclear um, safety and security violations, uh, which we observe now, whether all this is going to lead to more efficient international law enforcement methods? I hope so. There is already, you know, a very robust discussion in the nuclear field that like, clearly nobody is prepared, uh, that we need to think about these kind of situations as well. Uh, including on, on practical levels, as I've mentioned, all, all the safety and security um, SOPs were developed more with certain risks in mind. And uh, I think there will be a lot of reckoning in terms of the uh, international instruments. I, I think there will also be, I don't think like, this will impact interest in nuclear power, but I think it, it will give a pause to some countries that are maybe considering, mm -hmm. right, cooperation with Russia on civil nuclear, uh, uh, in the civil nuclear field, both because of sanctions, because Russia doesn't have access to components, but also in general, I think uh, in terms of just reputational risks, uh, they're severe. But um, yes, nobody has a clear idea yet uh, of how the, um, how this, what kind of changes need to be taken, but I think there is a recognition that there will be a lot of, uh, you know, reflection on what happened and how do we go forward from, from here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so I think um, there is a very straightforward question. I think it's mm -hmm. very nice uh, for the last question of uh, this evening. Alexey Gromyko, he's asking, what could you recommend for ordinary residents of Ukraine in face of risks of possible nuclear, nuclear accidents at the Parisian nuclear power plant? So I, and that's the question that I was receiving, especially in the, at the start of the war, um, you know, especially when we all worried so much about the tactical nuclear weapon and I don't know if it's true or not, but I've read that uh, in Zaporizhia, they even already, they distributed the stock of iodine that they had to local population. I don't know if it's true or not. Um, so to be honest, I don't think iodine tablets will, will help um, as much. I think if we're looking at the possibility of uh, of a very severe event, which I hope will not happen. Um, and I, I have faith that it won't, but I don't think anything except for truly moving far, far away from the site gonna help because, you know, um, the small precautions that can help to mitigate, uh, uh, for example, where you are, right? Whether you are protected inside of a building or outside, what type of food you consume, uh, and you know where the wind blows that day, for example. But I think, you know, in reality, it's it's more about being as further away as possible. But and again, here I'm just I just want to say as a on a personal level, you know, when the war started and I started receiving um, 
requests from from the media about oh what will happen if a tactical nuclear weapon is used and and it's almost as though i wanted to refuse discussing it because i see i saw it as part of the nuclear blackmail right an informational war that um it's partly i think you know part of russia's plan to make everybody afraid of everything nuclear and my answer back then would be that it doesn't matter whether it's tactical or strategic just the fact that we're discussing nuclear use in 2022 i think it's despicable it's just like completely wrong and and horrible and 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 similar with you know with the with the nuclear event that can be a possibility because of a nuclear accident. It's similar that, um, you know, there are practical things that can be done, but fundamentally, um, I think it's just plain wrong that we, we even faced with discussing it. So I just, um, I hope the war will be over soon and that Ukraine gets full control of all of its territory, of all its nuclear facilities, for the sake of Ukraine, but also for the sake of international community and international security. Thank you. Thank you for your answer to this question, but also broadly, you know, for your um, very interesting and informative lecture and your attitude and wisdom. So uh, we really appreciate that. And um, I also want to conclude saying that we look forward uh, to um, to host more guests, uh, Global Minds for Ukraine uh, will continue um, its series, and we will have a few more guests in September and October, including uh, Nobel Prize laureate uh, Dr. Deflo. We are looking forward to her lecture in the fall. So thank you, everyone. And um, I look forward to meeting you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye, everyone.